So this is not officially an astrophotography trip? No. Ashley and I are escaping this bitterly cold Canadian winter and are headed to Mexico for some much deserved rest and relaxation and deep sky astrophotography. That's right, a trip to an all-inclusive resort wouldn't be complete without a lengthy imaging session with my camera and star tracker on the beach. It's kind of my thing now, even if I look like a crazy person walking past the buffet with an EQ mount in one arm and a mojito in the other. I've done it before and I'll do it again. In this video, I'll go over exactly what I'm bringing on this trip and why. I'll explain my thought process for some of my intended targets to capture while I'm there, and some practical tips for any of you planning a trip like this. I'll follow up this video with a little vlog of the trip and what I captured. That's the plan anyway, unless I get a little too into the tequila and I forget to press record. Bringing a full-blown deep sky astrophotography kit on your vacation is a lot of extra work, but it can also be a lot of fun to image under a new sky. Because our destination is at a much lower latitude, it means I get to experience new stars, new constellations, and new deep sky objects that are too low on the horizon for me to see from home. If you're new to astrophotography and you go on a trip and really look at the night sky for the first time from a new latitude, it's a really exhilarating experience. In these situations, I recommend that you go after targets that are impossible to shoot from home even if you're pointing lower on the horizon than you normally would. That's exactly what I did when I captured the Carina Nebula from Costa Rica a few years ago. It's technically a southern hemisphere target, but I was situated just low enough on our blue marble to catch a glimpse of it. That polar alignment was tough. Oh, the North Star Polaris is so low. Uh, it's just above the resort. I'm pretty sure I found it. I can see the Big Dipper pointing towards it, but I'm not 100% sure, so. The photo turned out way better than I expected and it was such a cool experience overall. This time around, I won't be quite as far south. The resort we're going to sits at about 21 degrees north. That provides a lot more southern sky than at home here at good old 43 degrees. I'll see constellations like Vela, Centaurus, and even Crux skirt the southern horizon. I can punch in the coordinates of our hotel into Stellarium to get a preview of what the night sky will look like while we're there. I also know that that the beach at the resort faces east, looking into that dark Caribbean sea. I should have a nice flat view of the horizon looking into the general direction of southeast, which is perfect for the area of sky I'm interested in. Imagine that, I've picked a resort with the view of the sky I want during new moon. What are the odds? This is not officially an astrophotography trip. This is supposed to be relaxing for you too. That's how I relax, I make videos. No, that's not. How I, I need to travel as light as possible. Everything has to fit into my regular luggage and small carry-on bag. There's plenty of room for astro gear with this amount of space. The problem is I need to fit a week's worth of clothes in there too. I really thought about bringing a full-on telescope and cooled camera setup, auto guiding the whole nine. But I won't have power, I might have to set up in the sand and I'm on vacation for- So, with that being said, here's a look at the rig that I'll be bringing with me. The key component to this setup is the Skywatcher Star Adventure. This portable star tracker will allow me to track the apparent motion of the night sky and take long exposure images of my target. Riding on top of the Star Adventure will be my Canon EOS RA mirrorless camera and a Rokinon 135mm f2 lens. This stocky prime lens is fantastic for astrophotography. If you're looking for a nice mid-range telephoto lens for deep Deep Sky, highly recommend checking out this one. If you couldn't tell, this is a super wide field deep sky setup, compared to a telescope that is. Still, it has enough reach to resolve some of those larger nebulae structures in the sky. I'll bring my trusty remote shutter release cable to run a sequence of two minute exposures. With this lens at f2 or stop down a little bit to sharpen it up, I should be able to collect plenty of starlight on the camera sensor. The challenges will be polar aligning from a new lower latitude and babysitting the rig all night. I can't just leave it running on its own and go back to my room. As a matter of fact, I won't be setting it up at all if I don't end up finding a spot that I feel comfortable with in the dark. In previous situations like this, I've found spots to safely set up within the boundaries of the resort, but away from the obnoxious light pollution radiating from the hotel itself. I'll talk to the hotel staff and let them know what I'm up to as well. 
I don't need a security guard shining his flashlight in the middle of my three minute sub. There is a recreational rooftop area of this resort and I will inquire about setting up my gear in this spot. That would be perfect. If I can find someone there that appreciates astronomy, it might just work. Maybe I could even convince them to turn a few lights off. In these situations, you really have to feel it out. You wanna sweet talk them into why you're so passionate and how you've come all the way down here to photograph this sky. They're much more likely to be accommodating than if you start to complain about something. I don't wanna be known at the resort as that annoying telescope guy. As for my target, I need to stay pretty flexible because I don't know exactly what my horizon view will look like depending on where I set up. I also can't spend all night out there, so choosing an object that rises early is a must. For example, I'd love to go after something near Karina again, but it doesn't peak above the horizon until after 2 a.m. It also has to be something that looks good in its unfiltered, true color glory. Whatever the camera and lens sees in natural light, that's what I'll get. No filters, color mapping, and a very limited overall integration time. So with that being said, I've narrowed down my choices to the Seagull Nebula, and and hopefully later on a wide field view of the Pencil Nebula, GUM-15, and surrounding area. Okay, so technically I can shoot the Seagull Nebula from home, and I have before. But never at such a wide field and so high in apparent altitude. The bottom line is I'm going after the absolute brightest winter Milky Way targets from the constellation Canis Major and below. I've seen inspiring images of both these areas at a wide field, and I just hope I can collect enough quality frames to produce a great picture. If you're in a similar scenario in the future, here are the key points you need to remember when you're out there. Number one, the polar alignment needs to be perfect. So take the time to get that right. I use a simple free app on my phone called Polar Finder, and it does a great job of telling me exactly where I need to place the North Star in the illuminated reticle to be perfectly polar aligned. Then you adjust the alt as bolts on the mount and make sure that it's lined up perfectly for your location using the GPS on your phone. Number two, set the f-stop on the camera lens to f3.2. It doesn't have to be exactly that, but this f2 lens works best when it's at f3.2. That will still let plenty of light into the camera sensor, but it will sharpen the stars up. It will look a lot better at f3.2 than they will at f2. Number three, shoot in raw image format. This is a must. This gives you full control over the images after you shoot them. A lot of adjustments are available. You wanna look at that histogram to decide the appropriate exposure time and ISO setting for your individual image exposures. So here's an example here of what the histogram might look like. You just don't wanna clip the blacks or the whites on either side. All of the data is when, within the healthy region of the histogram there. So I'll probably be shooting at about an ISO 1600 for 120 seconds, a two minute exposure. Number four, you'll want to stack as many exposures together to increase that signal to noise ratio and have a great master file to process. So let's say I take 30 times two minute subs, that equals one hour of total exposure time for me to then stack and create a great master file. Just some basics to remember. Okay, enough talking about going on the trip, drawing pictures of histograms. It's time to go to Mexico, we need to pack, we leave tomorrow.